Thank you very much, dear Brigitte. We now prepare for our message for today. Our message is given by our brother, David Rennie. And the title for the message today is, My Instrument, My Life. So brothers and sisters, let's welcome our brother David with a big hands. Thank you. So good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning online. Um, the, uh, uh, the topic of my instrument and my life um, is sort of symbolic. Yeah? Am I my instrument? Is my instrument me? What I do to my instrument, do I do to myself? What I do to myself, do I do it to my instrument? So I've given you the conclusion, I can go home now. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> That, that, that is the conclusion, which normally should precede the, uh, the, the speech. Now, um, young people have dreams. Old people have stories. Yeah? Um, do the two marry together? Like the experience of somebody who's older, does it give inspiration to somebody that's, that's younger? That would be my hope. Yeah? Um, I heard on Radio 4 um, a uh, Christian minister saying, when I do a sermon, I give comfort to the afflicted. And then we thought, yeah, that's all right. And then he said, also, I give affliction to the comfortable. And I thought, now we got it. Yeah? So every time that I do a sermon, when I tell other people um, what to do, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. And the more I speak, the worse I feel. You know? Not the worse, but the more conflicted in my conscience I feel and the more directed. So um, Ron asked me, could I do a sermon which was both fun and serious and I thought well that's that's challenging you know um, you know my life is fun fun is joy joy is the purpose of life if you're not enjoying what you're doing you should change your lifestyle and do something else yeah what well, one's lifestyle should be full of joy whether it's the word is fun or not is open to debate but um, so uh, I am currently 68 years old um, and in the prime of my, uh, of my middle age and uh, I'm going to give you a little story uh, from 1978 yeah? which is when Reverend Moon, our true father, came to Cleve House um, and set up the Go World Brass Band which I was privileged to be a member of and he did that on the foundation of having inaugurated Home Church. In our meeting uh, last week, in the preparation meeting for this uh, Sunday service, somebody asked, how can you love the world? You know, it's impossible. We don't even meet the world. Yeah? So I knew the answer immediately, but I kept absolutely stumm there. I didn't say anything. Reverend Moon said, there are 360 degrees in a full circle, so take 360 houses and serve them unconditionally. And that full circle represents the universe. It represents all people. He said, you can then divide them into three groups, people who like you, people who are indifferent to you, or people who oppose you. So you can, you can focus your love on people who can respond to your love and then build up the relationship and finally teach them divine principle and take them to the blessing and help them to have a successful blessed life and blessed family. So the idea of loving all people, Reverend Moon said, you know, you symbolically do that by having 360 people in your sphere of influence. Now I'd like to ask everybody here uh, and online, do you have an address book on your smartphone, on your laptop, or in a paper book with 360 names on it? Probably yes. 
unless your name is Reverend Robin Marsh, who has 3,600 names on the same list. Yeah? He's constantly serving 3,600 people. Probably right now he's sitting at the back of a Sunday service with his laptop sending out invitation emails. That's the way to go. That you focus on who you want to love this week. I don't know if any of you have met Dr. Michael and Mrs. Balcom, but they pray for every person in the Europe and Middle East region by name. And they've got everybody's names up on the wall. So every time they pray, they are focusing their love on those people that, uh, that work with true parents at the moment. So when you meet them after two years, three years, they know your name. Why? Because they prayed for you probably 12 hours ago. That's how to love the world. Yeah? That's how to love God and love mankind. It's by being concerned and by being involved with people. So, let me have a look and see if this, uh, uh, this uh, clicker is going to work. Um, Take the button. Run, if it doesn't work, you'll, you'll need to... to um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's clicking like mad. Yeah. Right. Reverend Moon went out. Well, it, it's a damn one to go up. Okay. Right. Reverend Moon went out one day and bought sixty-one new instruments. Yeah, to start the Go World Brass Band, uh, to create a core of four new brass world, uh, new new bands. I was team eight, not four. So I joined about six months or a year later. Yeah. Um, we went to Reverend Moon said, "Here's my credit card. Yeah, go and buy." Beautiful instruments, not the most expensive, but the best for the purpose. Don't waste a penny, but do the best you can. So we went out to every music shop in London, and we said, right, we want to buy 50 trumpets, 20 flutes, 10 guitars, 4 basses, or whatever. And people said, really? You know? And uh, yes, we, we want a really good um, we want a really good discount. So we got quite famous. One day I went down to Charing Cross Road to a music store, um, Bill Lewington's music store, and I went in. You know, the word Go World Brass Band, it's really difficult to pronounce. It's too long, you know? We were called a brass band because the Americans had a marching brass band for Washington Monument. And I went in and I said, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I've come to collect a drum box um, for the Go World Brass Band. And and the lady on the couch said, Terry, Terry, come on, Reverend Moon's come for his drum boxes. <laughs> I thought, okay, we've been, we've been rumbled, you know. Everybody knows Reverend Moon's in town, you know. And uh, so when you walk in, that's Reverend Moon walking in, yeah. Um, quite a, quite a good, good feeling. So... Um, these were some of the instruments that um, uh, that we bought with with father's uh, father's money uh, laid out on the field of uh, on the on on the uh, in the hallway of of uh, uh, Cleve House. Yeah, uh, there were eighty. Finally, we bought eighty instruments, and I'd like to show you that this is one of the actual instruments which Reverend Moon bought. It wasn't my trumpet, but it was somebody else's trumpet. So this uh, trumpet is what, 1978, 30, it's nearly 50 years old now. Yeah? Now, Reverend Moon said, polish it with a cloth. Yeah? If you polish it with a cloth, it will shine. You have to keep a record of who uses this instrument and after 100 years somebody will come and look at this instrument and he said there will be a prize for who kept their instrument in the best condition. So I brought this trumpet home when uh, um, Toby Suda, who was playing it at the time, gave it back to me and my second son dropped it off the sofa onto the carpet. Bang! And it broke the bell. Big dent in the bell. 
And I thought, ah! So I took it to the music shop and they said, denting brass is easy. You just take a rubber hammer and you, you bend it out. Um, come back in three weeks. So I came back in three weeks and uh, I said, unfortunately, this, uh, this trumpet is Japanese. The Japanese use a special gold lacquer. And in order to make it look like new, you have to actually put Japanese gold lacquer on it. Not English brass lacquer, but proper gold lacquer. And I, they said, sit down, we'll tell you the price. And I said, well, how much is it? And they said, told you to sit down. And they told me, and I said, how much? You know, I mean, really, it was a lot of money. And the manager of the shop said, it is your moral duty to take care of this instrument. It's not your choice. It's your duty. Now do it, he said. And I thought, that's Reverend Moon speaking. That's exactly how he spoke to us. Yeah? And then my mobile phone went and they said, hello David, um, we've got a teaching contract for you. Would you like to take it? It's next week, it's a bit short term, but it will pay you X. That X was to the penny what that trumpet cost to repair. Yeah? In, in the shop, on my mobile phone, I couldn't believe it. So I said, okay, yeah, yeah, definitely, 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 definitely. So I paid for that and it's almost faultless yeah it's 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 beautifully restored now i wish it was absolutely perfect but being nearly 50 years old uh, that would be asking a bit too much so um, in yankee stadium in 1976 uh, mrs moon uh, designed these clothes so we wore these clothes um, as a marching band, first for Yankee Stadium, then Washington Monument, and then some of the Americans came over to England in the One World Crusade, all seminarians, and some of the really talented German brothers and sisters who were excellent musicians came over from Germany to form the Go World Brass Band. Yeah? Now, this is the prediction. Don't forget, this is 1978, yeah? The unification movement should open up a new age of witnessing to the truth with music, yeah? When, when John Lennon said, you know, I'm more famous than Jesus, the Christians in America went insane. And he said, don't be, don't be rude. He said, when Jesus tells you to do something, you don't do it. When I cut my hair in a sudden high hairstyle, everybody follows me. Therefore, my influence at the moment is bigger than Jesus. I'm not being arrogant, I'm being observe observational. So, pop stars, sports stars, they are more influential now than religious stars. So, Reverend Moon said, if you want to teach the truth, Become socially acceptable, become rock stars, become pop stars, become artists, become painters. Do something where your beauty can emerge and where people can latch on to your beauty and your interest. Yeah? Not just boring old lectures again and again and again. So people don't have uh, people don't have to come to church to hear the truth. They can watch television and listen to the radio and become unification members. Uh, people online, whoever Moon predicted the internet and predicted um, the fact that we're having a multi-regional service with one little little webcam, yeah, and. We can be watching this in Hemel Hempstead, we can be watching it in Milton Keynes, we can be watching it in Kent, Essex, maybe even in Seoul, Korea. You never know. Whoever's got the link, we have the electronic church now. We don't need to move. But what a profit! Reverend Moon is, to see that, yeah? When we were just getting VHS videotapes in, the, in that day, yeah? They're now redundant, yeah? So, nowadays music often has no life to it, but when people hear spirit-filled music more than three times, they won't be able to stop. Um, yesterday I was at a gospel concert for uh, Black Awareness Week, yeah? And we had our local gospel concert, um, a, a, a gospel choir coming in singing holy songs and at that time my granddaughters ran in the room I just 
burst into tears. I just could not control myself. I was so, so emotional. Yeah, that's how music. Uh, it gets to your heart. It transcends your head and it gets to your heart directly. Yeah. So they'll want to hear more and more and they will want to come to the lectures. Yeah. So this is Reverend Moon in Cleve House car park and all the members say, I want to be with him, I want to be with him, I want to be with him. Yeah. Quite a lovely picture. You, you might have seen it. It's quite a famous picture. Um, yeah, many of these uh, brothers and sisters are my, are my good friends and uh, some of them are still alive. Um, Jean-Pierre from France, Merdat from Iran, uh, from Japan, from uh, uh, Namibia, yeah, uh, all all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, uh, nationalities: Korea, Germany, uh, Austria. One from England, one from Switzerland. There, um, you might know these these brothers and sisters. Um, Reverend Moon said, I've got a purpose. I'm not randomly giving you music. I have a purpose. And he sat there with <coughs> Colonel Han translating uh, just by the wooden doors of a uh, wall of, of the of Cleve House, thinking and lecturing. And uh, uh, you know, there was nothing random about his plans. It was very deliberate. Yeah. Um, so then he said, when you get instruments, you have to pack your van correctly. And he said, come on, I will pack the instruments. So he took all the flutes and the piccolos and the little instruments, he put them under the, under the seats. Then he took the big bass drums and put them on the seats. Then he put the saxophones on top of the drums. And he said, you have to have a solid foundation to build high. So when you go around a corner, you, the instruments must not bang each other. They must not get, get damaged. You must buy really good cases for them and he just literally put his sleeves up and he, he packed all of the cases personally yeah and he said right as I've done it now you do it that's a commission from God yeah so every time I pack my van I'm thinking of this day you help me pack my van when we go to uh, uh, conferences and uh, you were very sympathetic the way you, you packed my microphones and things in my van. <laughs> do you remember, do you now see the significance of it? It was more than just physical. Yeah. Uh, so there were the, the first vans, um, we, we, we bought uh, new minibuses, we put all of the instruments, the, the different vans went out and we all went to different cities. Yeah? One went to Scotland, one went to South London, one North London, one Birmingham, uh, one Wales. Yeah? I think that was the first, the first groups. And Kevin Pickard, who's a, a trumpet professor from Juilliard Music School in New York, was our band director, completely inspirational man. He played five, six, seven, eight instruments um, fluently, you know, up to orchestral level. Yeah. Um, one little story. I was in, in uh, Cardiff. We had a witnessing centre in Cardiff shopping centre, yeah, and that's where the Manic Street preachers come from because there's so many crazy preachers out on the on the pedestrian area of Cardiff. And Kevin said, "I need to learn violin. Give me a violin." So we gave him one of the violins. He locked himself in the cupboard underneath the staircase for one week, and he did. C major scale, then G major scale, A major scale, then B flat, and then E flat. And he went through all of the keys. After one week, he joined the Cardiff National Orchestra of Wales as fifth violin. <laughs> from from a, a standing start of zero, he knew nothing other than to read music. Yeah. He's a trumpet professor, and he learned violin because he wanted to. Can we do that? Do we have that will? Yes. You know, at 68, why am I the only guitarist in this room? It's a travesty. I should be retired many years ago. <laughs> why don't we all learn a musical instrument? Yeah? 
Uh, it's very therapeutic. It's very good for your, for your lungs, for your blood supply, for your thinking, for your hormones. Yeah. It has many, many levels of effectiveness. Not just that you can give out, but there's a benefit to yourself. We look really weird. We, we were trying to look good, yeah? And uh, trying to look good, but not too attractive, yeah? Especially for our sisters, was really hard. It's, it's interesting. When you see the first generation, we came from a bad foundation. Yeah, we had, we had all sorts of family lineages that we came from. It's very hard for us to look good, yeah? But not showing off. Yeah? The second generation and third generation seem to have a natural purity that shines out that is not over attractive, but it's extremely beautiful. Yeah? It, it, you know, we've, we have in our lineage improved over time. I can testify to that. Yeah? Um, these were our bands. Um, we said, why, you know, we're not really. You know, this sister played double bass. That's not a, that's not a, uh, um, a marching band uh, instrument. You know, that's not a brass band instrument. That's an orchestral or jazz instrument. Yeah? So Reverend Moon said, whatever instrument you play, play three others. Just challenge yourself. Yeah? So I was a flute player, always have been, and so he said, right, play trumpet. I can't play trumpet, it's really difficult. So do it. And so I became third trumpet in Go or Brass Band, much to everybody's uh, pain and suffering, probably. Um, but we went around every single, every single town. Yeah? Um, we went around uh, Norwich and Ipswich, I remember. Which, which one of Norwich and Ipswich has got a big old fashioned wall around it? It's, it's, it's Norwich. That's Norwich. We we went round Norwich, round and round and round until our lips were bleeding, you know, we playing the trumpet so much. But what happened was we, we ended up bringing enough people to fill the whole Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. So this was our marching bands. I think this was in the city of London. I think this is Holborn, yeah, where, where that, that picture was taken. But we went on and on and on and on until we succeeded in the goal of home church, which was to hire the best hall in London to have our, to have our, our uh, uh, concert. Yeah? And we gave a divine principle lecture yeah. in the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, this is a this is a uh, anti-pornography rally in Trafalgar Square. Um, uh, being a photographer, I was whizzing about um, on the elevated. You know, by the National Gallery, there's an elevated um, walkway, and I was walking there with my camera, and this beautiful lady turned around and greeted me face to face, Mrs. Moon. <laughs> she recognized that there was a member there, and in the whole crowd of people, she was watching the rally. She turned around and greeted me, yeah, and then got on watch. But you know, she, <laughs> she's so sensitive, so sensitive who's, who's around her. I was really surprised, delighted, but surprised. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what a what a funny bunch of people we were. You know, the, these are our sisters. We tried to make them look look uh, beautiful and attractive, but not attractive and beautiful. If you get my if you get my my polite language, yeah. Um, it was it was hard. It really was hard. We tried all wearing the same. We tried all wearing different. We tried you know uniform, non-uniform. This is our witnessing centre in Bedminster. The road in Bristol. Yeah, we had an old shop, and uh, my job was to go around um, the new home church members and run witnessing evenings. Yeah, through through music. So uh, myself and a German sister, we went round and did flute and guitar for all of the witnessing evenings. Uh, this is our band practicing to go to the Royal Albert Hall and that's on the Royal Albert Memorial just outside the uh, Royal Albert Hall. Um, we, we got fairly good 
fairly good. I won't, I won't say, I mean, the Americans and the Germans were very good. The Europeans, we had a bit of catching up to do, yeah? We weren't really that good musicians, most of us. Now, this is interesting. This is True Father in Cleve House. You can see the, the windows that you know well. And this is me performing yeah, in, in a meeting. So that was sort of my, my meditation when I started to think about this sermon. That's what Reverend Moon wants us to do. And that's what we've actually done. How often do we compare that in our mind? Yeah? What's our mission and what's our accomplishment? This is where, this is where one, one uh, heaps affliction onto the comfortable. If one thinks one's comfortable and I'm so cool and I'm so this, you look at the reality of what the goal of life is and what you've actually accomplished and just put it on a scale and see which way flips in a, in a lopsided way. Yeah? But um, that is a... Uh, uh, that, that wasn't pleasant to produce that PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Just had to, had to think about it. Now, um, I've given all of you a copy of Reverend Moon's inaugural speech that he gave in uh, 1978 in Cleve House. You don't need to read it now. Yeah? Um, you can read it when you go home. It's one of my favorite speeches for meditation. Yeah? Um, uh, I'm just going to praise, I'm, I did a couple of lines on each page just to make a point. Yeah? This, these instruments will become a historical treasure for hundreds of years. Yeah? Where Jesus walked yeah? um, in Jerusalem before the crucifixion has become a place of pilgrimage for tens of thousands of people for thousands of years. Yeah? These instruments also are a physical sign of what Reverend Moon's idea for us was. Yeah? Um, Reverend Moon said history should be made for each instrument so that you know who owned it, who did what service with it. Only a very few of our instruments actually do have that history book, un unfortunately. We whiz about to too many centers and we just didn't take the time. It's a shame, it would be interesting. Now, it says, if you care for this instrument properly, your instrument can last for hundreds of years. If you have a brass instrument and you don't polish it, um, it rusts. Yeah, it becomes copper, copper oxide and copper nitrate and it goes all, all yuck inside. Yeah? So every two years I take that to a repair shop and I get them to clean it from, from inside. Now every single day when I finish playing my flute I clean it and I polish the silver and I find that the, the flute pronounces better when it's cleaner. Yeah? Reverend Moon said, when you have an instrument, you should be so intimate with it, you can take it to bed with you. Yeah? Now, that's really hard for the drummers. <laughs> it's quite easy for a violin player or a flute player. They can just whack it on a cushion. Yeah? But what he meant was, you need to be familiar with what you do until your, your relationship with your instrument becomes completely routine. This is a... Uh, uh, a, a D, D flat. This is a G sharp. Yeah? I haven't looked at my little finger for years, but when I pick up the flute, my finger goes to G sharp position. Yeah? And if you play the guitar, that's a C major position. That's routine. It's brainless. Yeah? It's just physiological. Yeah? So, Reverend Moon said, the same way that you play your instrument, you should give a lecture. So he said, if you play an instrument so the audience cry, you should be able to give a lecture exactly with the same emotion so that the audience cries at the topic that you're talking about. When a footballer scores a goal, people cry, they weep, they throw flares in the air, they kick the stands down, they go and attack somebody or whatever the... Yeah, but their emotions come 
bursting out. Yeah? Um, when a lead guitarist plays that lead break and he hits the high note, everybody has hormones secreted in their bloodstream of ecstasy. And, and it's not just the guitarist, it's the whole audience. Yeah? So when we have a lecture, should we be excited? Should we be joyful? Or should we just be bored and angry at the lecturer's importunity of wasting our time? I always think about that. Yeah? There are many lecturers which are just so boring, you think, actually, sir, instead of giving me a good divine principle lecture, you've just wasted 30 minutes when I could be having a cake instead. Yeah? How do you dare steal from me without even an apology? It's a thought, isn't it? So, uh, if, if you are a lecturer who bores people, shut up and get off stage. Yeah, that's the best thing. And yeah. practice until you actually become interesting. And if you're interesting, say something interesting. If you're not, shut up and go home. Yeah? And, and, and practice. Yeah? I think that about my guitar playing sometimes. I think I'm really not up to a, a standard. I should just go home. But as a missionary, I was on my own in a whole country. There was no other guitarist, so I just had to get a guitar and I just had to learn because I was the only one. And having some guitar is better than having no guitar. But I always think about that. Yeah. So, um, make your own lectures. Each one of you should make your own script for speaking. I'd like to ask everybody here and online, do you have an outline of a divine principle lecture in your pocket now? I do every day. I always carry a little notebook in my pocket, every single day. And every time I hear any sermon, I write down the topic of that sermon. Yeah, I go home, I research it, and I think, wow, cool. That would be a good lecture next time I come around to it. So I would recommend that you buy a ballpoint pen and a piece of a little A6 notebook to go in your pocket. Yeah. Reverend Byung Ho Kim said, Father always says, Hugh, do a song. And you think, oh, I can't, I know the words. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. So he said, I have a little black notebook in my pocket with two songs in it. So anytime Father randomly asks me, could you sing a song, at least I've got two that I can offer. So make your own lecture notes. If you're going to meet somebody tomorrow, what would you say? What would you say? I was in a Sai Baba. Um, Sai Baba is a, a, a messianic figure from the Indian subcontinent. Um, and the BBC came with their microphone and they put it to me and the national leader of the Sai Baba organization. And they said, why does a religious guru from India hang out with a religious guru from Korea? You know, what's your similarity? And I said, um, I said, Sai Baba is the Messiah of the Hindus in southern India. He's a regional Messiah, of which there are many in the latter days. But Reverend Moon is the Messiah bringing all religions together. And the national leader of the Sai Baba group said, Man, that was cool. If I'd only had a bit more preparation, I would have said that too. That's so clever, she said. And you said it live on BBC Radio. Well done, she said. And she said, by the way, I've got to tell you a secret. I'm a blessed couple. Reverend Moon invited me and my husband to his house in Champadong in Korea. And we were married directly by Reverend Moon. So she said, I do know Reverend Moon. So... Uh, you know, let's let's praise together, yeah. Which was which was lovely, yeah. But are we ready to give that lecture? Are we ready to give that interview? If somebody come to to tell us, what's your faith? What do you actually believe? You've got 15 seconds before the news. What are you going to say in 15 seconds? To make it concise, you've got to pr prepare. You've got to think about it, yeah. 
So Reverend Moon in 1978 predicted the electronic church and he said, I want you to go out and buy uh, some video recorders and go to every single home in your home church area with a video recorder and play them a lecture. He said, I know you're Japanese, I know you can't speak English, so just take a lecture, plug it into the person's telly and the, the video will give the lecture. You don't actually need fluent English at all, you know? Um, here's the lecture. So we, we put together lectures, we put them into videotapes, and we started the Goa Brass Band Audiovisual Studio in Lancaster Gate in order to distribute films, yeah? Um, which, was, which was wonderful. Um, now, Reverend Moon said, improve your technique. He said, you must be physically so good at what you do that you can forget your body and just concentrate on bringing the spirit. So he said, you need to practice. And we practiced from morning, night, noon, till midnight. We had a way of not upsetting the neighbors in, in Lancaster Gate at 1 a.m. We would clap like that. Yeah, we would applaud each other with two fingers so that we didn't make noise. But we were playing drums, trumpets, and saxophones, uh, you know, all day, all morning, in those little uh, uh, dugouts underneath the street in Lancaster Gate, you know, just outside in, in the basement. We were in the ballroom, we were in the roof, we were everywhere making loads of noise. But we practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And if you have a French mother, you will learn French by repetition. If you have an English member, mother, you will learn English by rep It's not any particular talent, it's just repetition of correct practices. Yeah? If your mum's German, you'll learn German. Yeah? So, if you want to learn an instrument, get a good teacher and repeat and repeat until it becomes habitual. Yeah? Once the physical is all right, then the spirit can flow. And it's the same with lecturing. The person that taught me seven day divine principle, he said, I knew nothing about divine principle. So I just took the black book and they just read it out over seven days. And he said, when I'd read the whole book about seven or eight times, I started to remember the order of the chapters. I remembered the topics and I became good at it. And I'm reputed to be Britain's finest lecturer. But he said, I didn't really know anything at the beginning, I just repeated. So if you want to get good at lecturing or music, first of all, get yourself a lecture or an instrument. Second, practice it. It's not magic, it's quite, it's quite simple. Yeah? Um, Father said, when you're hungry, you want to eat food. You must practice with the same feeling of desperate urgency. As somebody who really hates practice, I, I only practice my guitar on Saturday night, you know, when I know I've got to perform it on Sunday. Because uh, it hurts, it really hurts the fingers. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I think I'm going to give my love to others, I'm motivated to do it. If I think I'm only doing that for myself, I think I can't be bothered. I'd rather watch Star Trek on the telly or what, do anything else but not practice my, my, my instrument. Yeah? So focusing what you want to do because you know it will be of value to others, living for the sake of others, is the best way to get over the pain or the indemnity of practice. And it is a pain. It is a pain. Yeah. So, I'd like to finish with three lovely quotes here. Yeah? This is called The Keys to Success. You can forget everything else, but not what I've said today about the way to your success. The first point is to be emotional. When you play joyful music, you should express the happiness of someone who's loved for years and years without being noticed, yeah? and then was finally recognized by his beloved. That's gorgeous, that is. 
That is so beautiful, you know, that I really wanted to give love and be loved, but nobody noticed I was on desert island on my own. And finally there's somebody who will receive my love and who I can love in return, yeah? Uh, you know, be loved in return. Um, when you play sad music, you should express the passion of someone who was rejected by their lover and is ready even to die. You have to experience this and then reflect it in your music. Wow, that's quite... Uh quite emotional. The second is to practice with the hunger of a person who hasn't eaten for a day or more. When you eat food you will become bigger, when you practice you'll become better. Do you follow? Yeah, it's quite quite simple. Thirdly, you must take care of the musical instrument as you would take care of your own body so that it can last hundreds or thousands of years. The last instrument left after a thousand years will be irreplaceable. Have that feeling. Don't abuse, but always love your instrument. Finally, since the unification ideology will unite the world, I'm teaching you to master it for that purpose and to make it your own. So my personal conclusion, am I polished as I polish my instrument? Do I value my life in the same way that I value that instrument? Do I, do I polish myself with a clean cloth and come up shining? What did father and mother call it? You know, shining like a diamond at high noon time, you know, reflecting pure light, yeah? Um, Am I one with the providential timetable? And do I serve others with my talents, or do I just serve myself with my talents? Huh? Does anybody know how beautiful their face is? They really don't know, because your face is an offering to the person who's looking at you. Yeah? So Reverend Moon said, the type of color yeah, and I wore very deliberately pink, blue, and dark blue, and pink today. He said, the choice of your color should harmonize with the purpose of your lecture. And it should be an offering to the people who've come to see you. Yeah? So he said, don't be scruffy. Don't be overdressed, but don't be scruffy. Dress appropriately to giving joy, love, and truth to the person who is looking at you. If I've got Marmite on my mouth, I can't tell. You could immediately, yeah? So your appearance is your offering to the other person, yeah? So your life is your offering to your spouse. Your life is your offering, even biologically, to your grandchildren. Without making that offering, you won't have grandchildren. So you live only for that historical eventuality. And if they understand that, they'll say, Granny, Grandpa, thank you. We now see what you've done for us. Yeah? So, um, do I have 360 homes where I serve? I said that at the beginning, I'll just reprise it at the end. Am I recognized by at least 120 of them? Now I want to ask everybody online, yeah? Do you have 120 people who love you? To tears. To tears. I had one experience of our neighbor. Our neighbor was very elderly and he was, he had a bad back and he was always nearly blowing himself up with the gas cooker. And I walked in to turn his gas cooker off, and he said to the care worker who was there, Oh, David's come. I love him. I thought, that's how we should be recognized by everybody. David's come. I love him. So, or Reverend Moon's come. Mrs. Moon has come. I love them. That's the extension of who we are. Yeah? So, thank you very much for your great attention. Thank you online for uh, possibly an over-lengthy uh, speech, but I really like to 
to give all of my experiences as often and as long as possible. So uh, thank you, God bless you, and uh, good practicing. Yeah. I want you to please put your hand together. Let's welcome our dear sister, Sally Ann, our elder sister, to come and chair with us. Sally Ann, thank you. David, that's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> However, I've, I have to tell you that I was te I'm terribly tempted to say something completely different from what I promised to talk about. Um, maybe I'll tell you that another time about music and about our movement. What I really want to share with you today is this. It's, it's a great joy in my life. That's why I feel it fits well together with what David is saying. When I first came here, I stood in the same space. It was some years ago and it was just before Christmas. I'd never been to this congregation before. I was quite nervous. Believe me, I didn't know Francis. I didn't know his beautiful wife, Brigitte. I was quite nervous and um, I stood up here and um, I was just terribly excited with something I had started to work with and that was Heavenly Tribal Messiahship. I don't even know which year it was. I then couldn't come here um, on, a, on a more regular basis because it, it had to do with something within my family, and so I continued to go to South London. It also had to do with my husband. He knew the people in South London. And they were so kind to me. You know, it was Christmas, and they were giving different people Christmas presents and things like that. I mean, they didn't know me from a barge pole, and I want to say thank you so much. But I want to carry on telling about HTM and what I've done. Because recently I went... Um, I, you must have known about Heavenly Tribal Messiahship that um, there are kind of three types of ways in which people are engaging with it. They are either finding their, well, in the meantime, 360s become 430 couples and their tribe, or they have inherited from groups in uh, different countries where uh, True Mother blessed lots and lots and lots of people. And then there are people who have gone to countries where in those countries those members have gone out and blessed all of these people. So there are very different pictures that you see. I don't know if you know that book about uh, tribal messiahship, the third volume. It tells you about scads of people across the world who've done it in a very different way. It was that book that really inspired me. I thought, you know, if all these people can think about all these different ways of doing it, hey, there's got to be a way in there for me. Anyway, recently, I went to Zimbabwe, where we have a tribe, and it's quite difficult to talk to this. It, it, you know, I took ages to get going on this. And I can see that a lot of people now experience what I was experiencing then. They, they feel, I, I would love to do this, but you know, somehow, they're not quite sure why they can't move forward. A lot of people say, you know, I just do not have the money to invest in it. These seem to be the two difficult things. I want to tell you something about my going now to, for the very first time. Harare is in southern Africa, right next to South Africa, which is where I come from. This is one reason why I chose it, because also the official language there is English. I don't speak French. There are so many countries in Africa that speak French. I just can't. So I felt hugely, you know, once I had overcome my own fears, 
I'm doing this. I, I had a, it took me a long time to see a really, I feared doing this. What did I fear? I feared um, especially looking really stupid in a way, you know, especially towards our other family members, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, I'm, what are you really doing? You can't go around to people and say, by the way, you know, this is a kind of messiahship exercise. They, <laughs> and then one day, I heard Michael Balcom say to somebody, oh, you know what, we um, adopted a village in Nigeria. And I thought, oh, man, people like the way he's saying that. And a lot of people do that in a lot of different organizations. So that's what I also say. We adopted a village in Zimbabwe. This village is about almost three hours north of Harare towards the Mozambican border. And quite soon after I was, I received these lists of people and hundreds of photos. And I went out and I, uh, I uh, what do you call it? You know, I printed out all the photos. I had all the lists. I went through every single one. I went through all the numbers. I went matched all the people to the lists. And then I got some phone numbers. So I especially started not talking to, but messaging on WhatsApp, because on that side, they don't have money to put in their phones. So messaging, especially with one guy, the guy who had brought a lot of these people together. And what's really important to know about Zimbabwe and a couple of other African countries, there were many, many people blessed there by True Mother on the 18th of November 2018. Sorry. Sorry, I, I tend to think I've got a very loud voice. Um, many thousands of people were blessed on that day. And this one guy in the village where I went to, he went out and collected all these different numbers of people together, the 430 people. I want to tell you about my first visit there. So I had had a lot of uh, correspondence, really, I think you must call it, from one guy and from another guy as well who seemed much more, you know, it's difficult to judge people over WhatsApp and you don't know the people at all. But they were obviously also all very religious people and church-going people and I was happy about that. When I went there, I, just, I understood from this guy who had brought all these people together that he had a committee of seven people, seven couples. I thought, that's interesting. That's the place to start. No point in starting with 43 people. This is a mass of people to meet. You know, think of 43 people in this room. Thinking, think of 43 couples in this room. This is 86 people. They might bring a whole lot of people with them. And you, if you want to welcome them, you're paying to feed them. 86 people is a lot of people to feed. It really is. So I thought, OK, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there and let everybody just introduce me. And because this guy and me and this other guy, we kind of know each other. So I'm going to go and see these people. I'm just going to see this group of seven couples. It was a bit more complicated than that. And wherever you go in Africa, people are always massively polite, massively kind, and massively welcoming. They were like that. And in those moments when I was there, which was a whole weekend, I felt very welcomed. On the first day, I asked people to tell their experiences, how they got to that point. Why did they decide to do this? And it became very apparent that they had fought very hard to get this group together. People had called them Satanists. People had said that they were competing with the government. They were really, they, they had really gone out there and really fought. And the guy who had got all the names together, he's a very volatile sort of guy. He had been freaked out a lot of times. And then there was a second guy, and they all said, when we were freaked out, we went to so-and-so's house, 
and he calmed us down. Then you saw where the center of this group really was. It was the person who had been kind to them when they were completely freaked out and worried about what the government was going to do and a whole lot of stuff like this. On the second day, thanks very much. On the second day, they took us to all the homesteads, or I asked to go to the homesteads. I saw a lot of the homesteads. I saw how people were living. I saw, yes, I'm going to stop in two minutes' time. I saw the homesteads. It gave me lots of ideas of things that we can do, how they can really move forward. I want to say also that this village is not a village <coughs> which is totally down in the dumps. It's not. All of these people are farmers. They all have five hectares, that's 10 acres. They all can feed their families. The rains are coming in a couple of weeks' time. They're not interested in programs. Once the rain comes, those people are in the fields, they're getting their stuff to grow, they're getting their food on the ground. I feel massively positive about my work there. Massively positive. Yes, it's hard. But if you want to be by the spring of life, there's something about it which drives you nuts on one side, and on the other side, it just makes you fly. I know that a lot of people out there are afraid of this, and they're petrified of how much it might cost. Think about that. Think about why is it so terrible to be afraid of it? Give it a go. It's absolutely compelling. If you're worried about money, worry about things like that, let's get together in a group. I want to encourage everybody, all those people out there online. It's something I'll discuss from morning to night. If you want to talk about it, if you want to talk about how are we going to do this, I'm very excited about it. When I left there, and especially increasingly now, it was about a month ago, I realized it wasn't just that they welcomed me. I realized that every one of those seven couples, they were chosen to be there. Each one of them has got a different skill. Each one of them, one is interested in the youth. One guy's 94 years old. He brought his son along. He was able to do catering. They were just, I thought to myself, you know what? There are really fabulous seeds of the future here. I want to leave you with that. But I want to tell you that, if you're not excited about it, think about it. It's doable, I promise you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, my dear sister. Uh, Heavily Tribal Messiah activity is such an interesting thing. And uh, when you really do it, you connect. There's always that different feeling, different feeling. We bought, we bought two cows to feed our, our group when we were doing, but it, that's quite interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, are we wrong to say that we close the sharing for now, but is there one more person who wants to share? Okay. I was, I was in Slovenia very recently, very painfully, but um, maybe I will leave that another time. But the, uh, even though it was painful, we tried to turn the situation around to do Heavenly Tribal Messiah Blessing. That's, that's how it is. You know, my, my nephew passed away, he had a family, we wanted to bless him. When we went to do our blessing, he was not there. We wanted to bless him. But apparently, it wasn't possible. He has two children. And the family of the wife, they're really lovely. So on the 26th of November, we are having a 40-day uh, ceremony for him. And then on that day, we are also doing a heavenly tribal messiah blessing that evening so please pray for us thank you so much thank you